Thank you all, and thanks to Mike and the London Historians, and thanks to Tina Baxter and the rest of you. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I am a little distressed that I'm apparently not supposed to give this talk in Latin, which is how I had originally <laughs> conceived it. So um, I'm assuming that ancient Greek will work for everyone here. Um, but I am, as, as you doubtless know, is the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death this year, and so there are a lot of things going on in the Shakespeare world. There's been a lot happening here in London and elsewhere. While I was in London last year, one of my jobs in Atlanta, someone else, a, a, a chemist, was responsible for giving the opening talk. And, she very helpfully apparently announced that I was in the United Kingdom because it was the 40th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. But I'm hoping that as London historians you will understand that it's been a little bit longer than that. Last week in the Chronicle in Higher Education, which is the American equivalent, I suppose, of the Times Education Supplement, Scott Newstock, who's a Shakespearean at Rhodes College in um, Memphis, published an article designed for new university students. And it was how to think like Shakespeare. And one of the points that he made, which I think it is very easy for us to overlook, he was drawing the parallel between these students who have just started university. And he was saying, when Shakespeare was born, the profession he spent his life devoted to did not yet exist. The public theaters were not in place. The idea of being a playwright for a public theater was not in place. And obviously, by the time he was an adult, that had changed, and he did, did reasonably well as a public playwright. I'm going to talk to you tonight about some of the theaters, some of the history attached to that, some of the players. Um, I know in the uh, preview for the talk, it talked about why were people going to this, these entertainments anyway. The prior, when Shakespeare was young, there would have been performances going on in villages, maybe on carts, maybe in courtyards, things like that. Typically, the first purpose-built theater um, is the one that is called the theater. And occasionally, people give them a hard time about that, about how, how unoriginal that you call your theater the theater. But of course, this was the first one in England. And it was drawing on the tradition from, from Greece and the idea of a theater for spectacles. It's not clear, however, that it was, in fact, the first. Because in, in 1567, there was the Red Lion Theater at Mile End. And we know almost nothing about the Red Lion. It was involved in some um, legal disputes, which is, of course, how we know about most of everything that goes on in this period, because it was a very litigious society, and people sued each other all the time. Um, so we know very little about the Red Lion, but it may have been the first. There was also a theater in Newington Butts, and that, again, was prior to the theater being built in, in Shoreditch. So the theater was built in Shoreditch in 1576, and the curtain, about which there's been a lot of work done lately because of the recent um, excavation, was built in, in 1577. And theaters were um, problematic places. In 1572, plays and players were banned. So they were conceived for, for lots of reasons. And as you know, the whole anti-theatricality 
trends went on for a long time, people were upset about a number of things. I'll just give you a, a, a couple of examples. As you all know, during theater, during Shakespeare's time, the performers were all male. And so the, the men were dressed up as women. This was seen as being very, very problematic. Also, people were, this was a time during the sumptuary laws that were in place, you were supposed to be able to look at someone and tell by their apparel, et cetera, exactly their status in life. Well, when you had actors on the stage, that wasn't the case. They would be wearing things that did not fit with their station, it did not fit with their sex, it did not fit with all kinds of things. And so this was very, very problematic. <laughs> So in 1575, the theaters were banned from the city. And as you are London historians, you're all very familiar with what is in the city and what is outside the city. And so if you're looking at the, um, the, the theater map, the theaters typically now this, this theater map, this is, it's a wonderful website on Shakespeare's London theaters. I'm not convinced that the underground was there in the 16th century. <laughs> um, but this is, this is a very serious website that's put together by the V&A and others. So I'm assuming that that's my mistake. Um, and that the stories that we hear about um, people taking ferries across the river, you know, eastward ho, westward ho, was probably not true, that people would just hop on, hop, hop off the bus. Um, so the theaters were in places that were outside the regulation of, of the city. Bands kept continuing. In 1594, there was a ban on inns being used. That was one of the places that people did a lot of performances. And so that was when the Red Bull and the Boar's Head shifted to being theaters. So people were regularly trying to get around all of these different, different laws and things. So the theater in Shoreditch was owned and operated by the Burbage family, who of course were very prominent actors and what we would call they were theatrical people. And their um, lease was running out. And they got into all kinds of problems with their landlord, Giles Allen. And there were, again, lots of legal disputes about who owned the land, who owned the building, were they going to continue there, et cetera. Um, Burbage, Burbage, there's a, a quote, Julian Bauscher, who some of you may know from the Museum of London, an archeologist who's done a lot of the theatrical archeology span in London. He's got what I think is a, a wonderful quote from Burbage where he says, he cared not a curd for conscience. And there's lots of stories both in Bauscher and in other, um, Andy Gurr and Tiffany Stern and the other theatrical historians of Burbage and his family chasing people away with broomsticks when they came and tried to take over his property or his theaters or anything like that. Anyway, with the, the theater, the, um, the situation was not improving. He, they were not going to um, work this out. Now this is one of the places, so we're moving from Shoreditch, and this is when um, we moved to Southwark, uh, to near the site of the current globe, but as you probably know, not exactly on the site of the globe. Now this is one of the things where um, storytelling and history don't exactly match up. Much the same, however much you may love Shakespeare in love. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth did not hop on the tube and go to the globe. Okay. Um, Judy Dench may, I don't know. 
But the story with this is that, um, that the Burbages, what they, they were going to set up another theater, but, and they were going to go to Blackfriars, and the, the, um, the senior Burbage died right before, in the midst of all of this, and so sort of left his family with the mess. But here's the, the petition that the neighbors drew up to complain about the potential move to Blackfriars. One of the things I like about this, and I think I like about a lot of this theatrical history, is it rings so familiarly. You know, when you think about, you know, certainly what in America we call not in my backyard. <laughs> so this is, this is the not in my backyard from 1596. That whereas one Burbage hath lately brought, bought certain rooms in the same precinct near adjoining unto the dwelling houses of the Right Honorable, the Lord Chamberlain, and the Lord of Hunston, which rooms the said Burbage is now altering and meaneth very shortly to convert and turn the same into a common playhouse, which will grow to be a very great annoyance and trouble, not only to all the noblemen and gentlemen thereabout inhabiting, but also a general inconvenience to all the inhabitants of the same precinct, both by reason of the great resort and gathering together of all manner of vagrant and lewd persons that under color of resorting to the plays will come thither and work all manner of mischief. And also to the great pestering and filling up of the same precinct, if it should please God to send any visitation of sickness as heretofore hath been, for that same precinct is already growing very populous. And besides, that same playhouse is so near the church that the noise of the drums and trumpets will greatly disturb and hinder both the ministers and parishioners in time of divine service and sermons. Now all players being banished by the Lord Mayor from playing within the city by reason of the great inconveniences and ill rule that followed them, they now think to plant themselves in liberties. So again, we don't want these people there creating all of this noise and disruption. So this, this is a list of the various theaters. You might sort of try to keep that in mind. We're starting from the Red Lion and now talking about the, the theater, which is about the same time as the curtain, and we're going on then to the globe. So this is at the, the theater. Um, now this is where history gets a little bit murky because the Burbages decided that if they couldn't win this legal case, which it seemed unlikely that they were going to, that they would just take the building and run. If you... Now, you can see the theater here. Now, the story makes it sound as though they waited till the pubs closed one night, took all the timber, dismantled the building, went across the river, and they woke up the next morning and the globe was there. <laughs> That's the way that the historical record is, is often presented. That's clearly not exactly what happened. Dismantling, they did dismantle the theater, they did take it across the river, they did rebuild it, but um, it didn't happen in the blink of an eye, as it's often said. They also, and this, this fits with um, certainly um, people when they're talking about setting up businesses, it's all often helpful to have other businesses in the area. They set it up right near the Rose Theater, which you can also go to that excavation site now. The Rose Theater people were not happy about that, and so they then moved back across the river. But one of the problems that happened was that the Burbages really didn't have any money. And so all of these lawsuits and moving the theater, building the new theater and all of this, this was a real problem which actually is probably one of the main reasons that, we, that Shakespeare became rich and well-known was because the Burbages had to 
come up with some way to get themselves out of this big financial mess that they had created. And so what they determined was that there were a group of the players and playwrights who were going to become shareholders. And this was new. So Shakespeare was one of the people who bought into the theater company. And this is an, a, a description of the shareholders. The accepted and agreed value of a share was a safeguard of the interests of the individual sharer and of his family, being part of a body of assets, including goodwill as well as properties, playbooks, and costumes, to which he had contributed either in money or by his skill, or both. But it was also a pawn or hostage by which the whole body of sharers safeguarded the general interests of the company. The actual and real value of a share depended upon the condition of the company and of the trade in which it was engaged. It seems pretty clear that it was not an asset likely to justify itself in a court of law. It was very different, of course, with a share in, by lease in a playhouse building or ground. And this is one of the things that the, the theater building is part of what you had a share in. But you also had a share in the business and the properties and the costumes and things. I know that um, last week you reburned London on the Thames. I was really very sorry to have missed that. But as you know, the propensity of fires was a problem. When the globe burned down, um, famously, they were able to that they shot off a cannon for Henry VIII and it, it set the whole thing on fire and they set a man's britches on fire and they poured beer on him. And the beer put out the fire on him, the, the building. But it was during the day and so people were able to race in and grab the costumes and the plays and the properties and all of those things that kept them going financially. When the um, fortune burned down, it was at night. And so they lost everything. They lost all of their properties, all of their plays. The plays were really how they made their money. And again, one of the things I will talk a little bit about in a moment, but um, the, the play, it's one of the reasons why we don't have um, the Shakespeare manuscripts and things that people often think that we, ha you know, which partly it's because Queen Elizabeth II wrote the plays. But if you set that aside, it's also that Shakespeare's money came from the, th the theatrical endeavor, not publishing his work would not have brought him the money. And that just wasn't of, of particular interest. So again, the, um, the companies became more and more popular. By 1629, there were three indoor halls and three open air playhouses. And, but eventually, most of the new plays were written for the indoor theaters. And for those of you who've gone to the San Wanamaker Theater in the Globe, you can see there's a big difference between the plays that were written for the outdoor theaters and the plays that were written for the indoor theaters. The outdoor theaters, obviously, things were during the day. You can have a lot, so they didn't have to have candles and things. You didn't have to have breaks for acts and scenes. In the indoor theaters, you had to have breaks because you had to relight the candles. So just real practical reasons. You had to stop periodically to trim the candles and, and light them again. You also, you can't, you have to um, modulate sound if you're inside. And smells are different inside. So you can actually go through Shakespeare's plays and there's hints within the play telling you which theaters they were built for. The plays here, for the most part, the, you, could, you could go for a penny if you were going to be what we call a groundling, um, which was about the same as it would cost for 
other kinds of entertainment like bear baiting and prostitution. And I'm always a little bemused by the fact that they talk about prostitution of, you know, am I going to go out with a prostitute or watch a bear rip a dog to shreds? I don't know, it's all, it's all the same. Um, there were also lots of um, uh, links with the court, as you may be aware. So here we've got the Globe Theater. Because the, and here, this is Andrew Gurr on the, on the court. The advantage to the players of pleasing the court was straightforward. Financially, they gained little. The fee for taking a play to court was 10 pounds, comparable to the income they would gain from royal pay, from a good day in their common playhouse. So performing for the court wasn't a big money maker. What they did gain from royal patronage was prestige and more tangibly some protection against the wolves of Guildhall who prowled around the London folds throughout the 16th century. When James gave his name to Shakespeare's company, he gave the security as well as prestige. So that was a lot of how they kept going um, and how they could perform. As, as you may know, Edmund Tilney was master of the revels and he, everything had to go through censors in order, had to be approved by censors. And again, what we have in terms of documentation, we've often got, you know, in, um, in Shakespeare there's the talk about two hours traffic of this stage, and so people talk about plays being two hours long. If you go to the Royal Shakespeare Company or if you go to the Globe, they're likely to be three or three and a half hours long. And there's various um, theories about that. Sometimes people believe that original practice, they just talked really fast and that that's what they did and so people would just listen really fast because they were there and they were there as auditors. And there's some truth to that. But it's also true that what had to go through the censors was the longest possible version of the play. So that what actually was performed may well not correspond with what was approved by the censors. At the, the time, again, the, you see the flag there, there was a lot of advertisement, a lot of placards around the city. One of the things about the plays is, in, particularly in London, is that they had an extraordinary repertoire. We have play runs where you'll go see the same play, you know, it might be showing seven times a week. These plays, many of them would not have shown seven times, period. They were in constant rotation. This is again Andrew Gurr talking about the, the plays at the time. An Alain or Burbage had to be able to deliver more than 4,000 lines of verse in six different plays through every week of his life while he worked in London. Tours with mo no more than three or four plays must have felt like a holiday in comparison. So what happened when theaters closed because of um, plague or something like that, they would go on tour. And when they were on tour, they could do a couple of plays, they'd move on to the next town, they'd do a couple of plays. So they had a much more limited repertory. Whereas in London, people were going to the theater a lot and the numbers of people in London kept growing. And so they had to have a phenomenal um, number of plays. It does say, it's not surprising therefore that some of the leading players seem to have avoided playing in London, even though they, they talk about Martin Slater, who was a very prominent um, player in the countryside, and he apparently had a wife and nine children living in London. But he was never in London, I guess, except for the once every nine months that he needed to be here. Um, so actually in London, that, so again, you can see part of what, you would, you would get is because of the design of the stage and then the characters, you'd get a lot of stock figures. So you'd have actors who were playing, like here you've got the hostess and some of these others that 
the people would be learning um, roles based on parts that they frequently had. They also, again, if you think about a modern actor, you're going to get a script, and a modern actor is going to go through and mark up the script. An actor at this time, partly because paper was so expensive, and partly because they didn't want plays to be stolen by other people, they would just get their part. And they, there would be cues for their parts. And they would have to go on stage and listen for their cue. And the actors often didn't have a clue what was actually going to happen in the play as a whole. Um, so not only would the audience not know, but the actors wouldn't know either. But you'd have somebody like Burbage who always played the king or something like that, or you have um, the, the clown figures. And again, with, with Shakespeare, he would... Um, Will Kemp was a famous clown in Shakespeare, and when he left the company, when, because he was going to, as one does, he was going to dance between here and Norfolk, um, which you are all invited to do after we go to the pub this evening. Um, another, uh, Robert Armin came in. And again, with Shakespeare's plays, you can often tell by the text who the actors were because things shift. And sometimes they shift even during the, presumably, the performance of the play. In Twelfth Night, at the beginning of Twelfth Night, when Viola is going to take on her costume and she says she's going to go to Duke Orsino's court and she's going to be a, um, a eunuch and she's going to sing. And if you've seen Twelfth Night, you realize that Viola doesn't sing, that Festi does the songs. And the presumption is that the actor who was playing Viola got too old and that his voice broke. And so that he was no longer able to do the singing, so they gave the songs to somebody else. And those kinds of things happen not infrequently, where you can see by a particular person, um, but there was much more typecasting than you would have imagined. So one of the things that also was included was the idea of why people were going to all of these plays. And part of it, again, something that I think hasn't changed a lot, blood, sex, and violence all sells. And there, some of the plays you are, um, may or may not be familiar with by, by Shakespeare, where um, Mike and I were at an event, a Shakespeare event recently, where they offered us um, pies and a pint. And they gave us coupons for the pies. Well, on the coupons were quotes from Titus Andronicus. <laughs> and there were quotes that were specifically from the moment when Tamara realizes that she has just taken a big bite out of her sons. And these were the pies that they were offering us to, I opted for the vegetarian pie. I, I have. But there's also, and this, this is not a Shakespeare play, but Lucy Monroe talks about a, a play you've probably never heard of before, which is Claudius Tiberius Nero. Came, it was in print in 1607. The play focuses on the villainy of the Roman Emperor Tiberius. And he's got two nephews who are Drusus and Nero who are about to starve to death in prison. Before they die, however, they decide that they will try to keep each other alive 
by eating each other's arms. And the stage direction says, they eat each other's arms. <laughs> there were also lots of directions for things like this is how, and you might want to take notes on this, um, how you might appear to stab yourself. Take a bodkin so made as the haft being hollow, the blade thereof may slip thereinto as soon as you hold the point upward and set the same to your forehead and seem to thrust it into your head. And so with a little sponge in your hand, you may wring out blood or wine, making the beholders think the blood or the wine, whereof you may say you have drunk very much, runneth out of your forehead. So there's going to be lots of these things going on. A lot of the plays will have stage directions that say a character walks in carrying a leg or lots of severed heads, which of course people would be familiar with severed heads because of the, the heads um, being put on the bridges in London. But there also were, was a lot written about how do you do the stage effects. For example, if you've got, if you're using pig blood, which is one of the things that they would use. You know, if I came up here, I'm sure Gresham College wouldn't mind if I came up and sort of spread pig blood around here, um, then somebody's got to clean it up. And so there's lots of records that will talk about severed heads or severed limbs that have blood already on them so that they can do things in, that will get people's attention without creating a big mess. But there were other things about creating big messes which also made um, theaters very popular. Some of the theaters actually alternated bear baiting and plays. So on different nights, you would either see bear baiting or you would see a play. Now, one of the problems with this, and this was particularly a problem at the Hope Theater, um, I don't know if anybody here has ever seen bear baiting. Probably not a lot of that going on. But you can imagine, it smells really bad. You know, you bring a lot of animals in, and they're doing what animals do, and then they're ripping each other to shreds, to the death, and then, that's on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we've got Hamlet. <laughs> and you've got the air permeated with all of the things from the night before with the bear baiting. So again, it was one of the things that the, the theaters had to deal with. And it's one of the reasons when they moved to indoor theaters where the prices went up, where they were dealing with a higher class, when they were working at the Inns of Court, for example, and they had the lawyers who could afford, part of what that was doing was that they were able to get a clientele that could afford to go to a place that wasn't doing bear baiting on the other days. The other thing, though, and I don't know if we've got any archaeologists here in the group, but I do think it's really, the, theatrical archaeology is much more interesting than you might think. And I know that when the globe was being rebuilt, people used to have these passionate arguments over the pillars. And if you've been to the globe, you can understand that people still have passionate arguments about the pillars. But there's lots of other things as well. and. Um, People, again, they would go to the plays. There, lots of beer was being sold, you know, lots of snacks and things. There would be prostitutes roaming around. But if any of you have ever been in a situation where lots of beer is drunk, there are, well, you may have read about it or seen it on television. <laughs> There are occasionally biological consequences to large quantities of beer being consumed. And so this is one of the things that archaeologists have gotten very interested about. And this is a, a quote from one. Given all the food and drink, must 
that must have given many spectators problems, at least with their, it's urine in the UK, right? We would say urine. Is it urine? P. It has been suggested that for those seated in the galleries, the topmost gallery's back wall would have been useful for men, since the steep angle of vision there allowed only about three steep ranks of seating, which left several feet of empty space behind for other uses. Tests done at Wanamaker's Globe on Elizabethan lime plaster as wall filling indicate that it could easily withstand erosions from flows of urine. Women might have had special pots under their skirts to receive their outflows, subsequently decanted into available buckets. A report by Gail Kern Pastor that a maker of gunpowder, the saltpeter aspect for which was taken from urine, got the right at Ely Cathedral to scrape the sections of the floor where women stood at church services. <laughs> the masses of plaster from the wall infills found in the yard of the rose received no testing for possible urine content, however. So again, that's one of the things that when they're doing the archeology span at the curtain, and I know that the, um, Julian Boucher has a book on theater land that's really quite interesting, but he now keeps saying, don't pay any attention to the chapter on the curtain, it's all wrong, it's all wrong. And, but that's part of what people will be looking for, is again, what did people do? Pre presume, you know, you're drinking all this beer, you don't have all of the facilities that we have at modern theaters, it had to go someplace. And, um, so that's part of what they are looking at now. Um, it's another reason why um, theaters were considered to be problematic. Another thing to um, keep in mind is that, again, I mentioned at the beginning that we talk, if you typically, you say, I'm going to go see a play, right? I'm going to go to the National, I'm going to see a play. In Shakespeare's time, people would say, I'm going to go hear a play. And there, a lot of the, I'm not sure, if you look, there would be places, and if you go to the Globe or the Wanamaker now, you'll sometimes you'll get people sitting on the stage or on the side. They're not necessarily, the most expensive seats are not necessarily the ones that are the, are the best viewing. Often people would be going to be seen. They'd be showing off their fancy new clothes. They'd be showing that they were rich enough to be able to afford to sit up there. But it also suggests that theatrical practices at this point were not presenting outwardly in the same way that we're accustomed to. That audiences would be looking and hearing in different, in different directions. Um, one of the things with the, um, with the plays is that, again, as you know, they, they, had, they went in and out of fashion with the law. They would close during plague years. Although, and this I find really fascinating, we don't have plague plays from this period, which is really fairly striking that you would assume that Shakespeare or somebody would have written about this pestilence that, that created so much um, havoc in their lives. Anyway, I, I want to finish by giving you some sense of what we know, what we don't know, and why we don't know it. There were about 3,000 plays performed in London during this period. We have the text of about 600. So a lot of the plays are lost. A lot of what we have information is because Philip Henslow kept what he called a diary, but it was basically an account book. 
and he lists things like names of plays, how much was brought in at the box office, what props and things were, were costing. If it weren't for his account books, there's a lot of information that we would not have. And that's one of the things, if you, any of you went to the Royal Shakespeare Company last year, they performed, there's a play, Love's Labor's Lost, which you may be aware of. There's a listing of a play, Love's Labor's Won, and that's all we have is the title. Last year, Greg Doran at the RSC determined that Love's Labor's Won was really much ado about nothing, and so he performed the two together. Personally, I don't buy it, but he's head of the RSC, so maybe he's, maybe he's right. Um, so there's a lot of things that we just don't know. Again, 1623 was when the first folio was printed, and that was very unusual. Um, Shakespeare's collaborators put together his plays. About half of Shakespeare's plays would not exist if they had not put the first folio together. We wouldn't have Macbeth, for example. Um, so it was a time, because, again, that although eventually buying plays became, um, became lucrative, it hadn't been prior to that. So all of this then, 1642, stops. Theaters are closed. We've got a big period of time when none of this is going on. Some of the theaters are di dismantled. Some continue. Some of the theaters, again, as you know, both the Rose and the Curtain were found somewhat unexpectedly. There's some of the theaters that we're pretty sure we will never find because of building that went on in the 50s when they were building basements and things that sort of dug things out. Um, but 1642, the theaters closed, and at the time that they reopened, all hell broke loose because they let women on the stage. So it's really probably better to pay attention to Shakespeare's period when such vile things were not allowed to happen. <laughs> Thank you very much.